Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our January Klamath Film member meeting. Appreciate everyone being here. And I assume we'll have a few more kind of linger in since we're downstairs and folks are probably around the bar wondering where, where are we? Uh, and we always have a few people come in late on our uh, Zoom call as well. Our guest tonight is Nisha Burton, who will be joining us in a few minutes. She is a filmmaker. She had a documentary in our 2021 Klamath Independent Film Festival um, called A Hurricane with Fire, which was all about the massive fires out in the Ashland Phoenix area in 2020. Um, so that uh, documentary took third place with us for best uh, Southern short film that year. She is also the um, Southern Oregon representative for Oregon Media Production Association, OMPA. And so she'll talk about how OMPA helps us out with um, uh, bringing film productions to the area and how they can assist with productions and get people connected if they're uh, interested in being an actor or a crew member or whatnot, how, how OMPA can assist with getting you connected with, with all of that. So first of all, welcome. Hello to everyone who is joining us via Zoom, Lori, Alice, Nina, and I, I hope we'll get a couple others. Thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. I uh, do have a couple of announcements to start off, and I'll, um, if people come in late, I'll, I'll bring this up again. But right now, there's a job opening for a video editor full time. So if anyone has video editing skills and uh, it, it wants to potentially be uh, doing that full time out in the Medford Ashland area, Nick Alexander Films is actively looking for a video editor at, at the moment. So uh, if uh, that is of interest, contact Nick. We also have a short film that is hi alice hello thank you so much for being here um should also apologize for the background noise uh the uh, growler guys cannot turn off the 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 radio so we're, we're going to have background music throughout the entire evening so uh for those of you on zoom hopefully you you don't hear it too much but uh it, it's going to bug us all, all night i'm sure um we have a, a film shooting in klamath next week uh, there is a Portland-based filmmaker named J.T. Seaton. He was in our film festival last year with an amazing short film called The Haunted Baby Carriage from Hell, which is, uh, I mean, that title alone is just great. Um, it had all of the classic 70s and 80s horror movie tropes, but spun on its head in that everyone who was in the film uh, was just annoyed by the killer carriage. Like they didn't care. They weren't scared by it. They're just like, get out of here. What, whatever. So a f fun little kind of twist on, on the classic horror tropes with that film. He loved our festival so much. He decided to make his next film in Klamath. So, uh, our vice chair with, uh, yeah. Uh, N Nina Ch chime in. Yeah. That was one of my favorite films last year was Haunted Baby Carriage from Hell. I loved that movie so much. It was so much was better. Super funny. Yeah, it was so much better than it had any right to be based on the title, right? <laughs> right, you didn't know what to expect. It was really, really good. It did not disappoint at all. So JT was here for all three days of our film festival last September. And he had such a blast in Klamath. He decided, I'm going to make, make my next film here in Klamath. And so they're going to be filming in January and February for their next feature film. Um, one of our board members, Bowen Browder, is going to be co-starring in the film. Uh, and we need extras. So if anyone is interested in being in a film on Sunday, January 28th, from 11 to 5, we're going to be filming at Night Owl Bar and O'Hare uh, Funeral Chapter. So if any, check your calendars. If people are interested in potentially being in that film, um, it is a low budget short, but uh, we would love to have you involved. I'm sure at the very least we'll feed you. Um, uh, you do need to dress in all black for the funeral scene. And then it's just typical like bar hangout, uh, nightclub vibe for, for the uh, night owl bar. So, uh, shooting two scenes and we need around 10 extras for that. We have a few already confirmed, but if anyone else is interested in being a part of that, we would love your participation. So Alice, uh, I think this is your, your first time joining us. I'm not sure if you're based in Klamath or not, but if you want to be in a film, Hey, here's an opportunity. And Lori, if, if you're available, we'd love to have you be a part of the film too. What day was that again? Sunday, January 28th from 11 to 5 PM. And I, I can send out follow-up emails about it. Does that work in your schedule? 
I would need to check. Um, possibly. Okay. Oh, that's right. Alice, I did get an email from you saying that you and John were, were available for extras. So yes, thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, we have you on the schedule and I also passed along your contact info to the director, JT. Um, so he may be getting in touch with you prior to uh, the start of filming, just to kind of confirm where and when and what to expect for it. But we greatly appreciate you being a part of it. And if anyone else here wants to be uh, an extra in an upcoming film later this month, we'd love to ha have you be involved. Um, we, as an organization, for those of you who are here for the first time joining us, Climate Film has been around for about 13 years now, and it started as a collective of local filmmakers just kind of getting together, wanting to you know collaborate more on, on projects. We started the Climate Independent Film Festival uh, 12 years ago, and that has grown from just an afternoon thing of just us showing our local stuff into a nationally recognized multi-day film festival that happens at the Ross Ragland. Um, so this year we're still finalizing dates on that, but it'll probably be late September. Uh, and our window for submissions opens February 1st. So for our filmmakers who are on the call or filmmakers present, if you have a film, you have between February 1st and June 1st to submit. We do provide, uh, waivers. There is a $20 submission fee, but we will always provide a waiver if someone asks, uh, for, for that. So if you have an idea for a film, you want to work on it or you have a film that you finished and you want to try to submit it, February 1st is when that that, that submission window is going to open up, and that's on Film Freeway. Uh, we are also the film liaison office for Klamath County. So anytime that there is a film production happening in the area, be it TV commercial, TV show, documentary, short film, feature film, what, whatever, we are actively involved in terms of location scouting and lining up equipment, local cast and crew, permits and anything else that we can do to help out with, with the production. We're actively doing lodging, catering, all, all of the things that go into, into filmmaking. So we're, we're active with all of that stuff. Um, like the film that's coming up next week, we've been active with that. Uh, we have several films that we are in ongoing talks to also come um, throughout the course of this year. Typically, we get around maybe 10 films a year that, that shoot in the Klamath Basin, and that's been growing every year. So we're, we're slowly building a little bit more moment, momentum, which is wonderful. We just had a feature film shoot here in October, and they are in post-production right now. That should probably have its world premiere this spring, and we're going to push hard to have a special one-night-only screening either at the Pelican or the Ross Ragland uh, um, sometime maybe around like April or May. Um, upcoming events, we will do our every year before, for the Academy Awards, we do an evening of all of the nominated short films. So everyone sees the big blockbusters, right? But no one ever sees the short films. Maybe one or two get picked up by Amazon or Netflix. But typically there's all these categories for animated and live action that no one ever sees. And so we always do, usually the night before the Academy Awards, we'll do three or four hours of all the nominated films. And we're going to try to do them right here at, the, at Growler Guys, so everyone can get food and a beer and get dinner and hang out and, and watch movies right before the Academy Awards. Uh, we also are going to be doing on April 20th, um, our Earth Day screenings, um, which we've done for the last two years, uh, environmentally based films for Earth Day. And we may do a couple of other special screenings throughout the course of, of, of the year. Additionally, anyone who is a member of Klamath Film, which membership is $25 a year, uh, you are eligible to check out any of our equipment. We have a, 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 a professional equipment collection of sort of probably around fifty dollars or $60,000 at this point. Cinema grade quality cameras and lenses, uh, microphones, backdrops, C-stands, uh, all kinds of gear and equipment to for production. So if you have an idea for a film, but you don't necessarily have all of the equipment, 25 bucks is a one-year membership, and then you can check out what, whatever you need in order to make your film look amazing. So that is us as, as Climate Film, um, and uh, that's kind of some of the upcoming things. So if you are interested in being an extra, and thank you, Alice and John, uh, for uh, agreeing to be an extra in our film. And if anyone else, I know you have to work, unfortunately, uh, that 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 day. Um, then we will, uh, hey, hello, Anthony and John, come on in. Sorry, we're, we're down here with the background music yet again. Um, but at least it's not Christmas music this time. But I appreciate you being here. And Anthony, you and I need to talk about the the place on Main Street as, as well. So, um 
I was just going through the, the rundown of activities. So for, for you two, FYI, we have a short film that's shooting here next week, and they need extras. So if either of you are available on Sunday, January 28th from 11 to 5, we're going to be filming at Night Owl Bar and O'Hare uh, Funeral Chapter. And we need additional people to be in the film. So if you're interested, talk to me and I'll give you more details about it. Okay. Other than that, I was just giving a basic rundown because we have several first timers who, who are here. Uh, and then our guests should be joining in about five minutes. So we can run through uh, some quick introductions to kind of get to know everybody. And and uh, if anyone is working on any projects or has any sort of announcements or upcoming things, it's always an opportunity to kind of get to know what everyone else is working on. So first of all, I'm Kurt Lidke. I'm the uh, interim director of Climate Film. Previously, I was director from 2020 to 2022. Uh, I was board chair, but our executive director uh, resigned in December. So I've stepped back into that role. I'm a filmmaker who worked in Hollywood for about 12 years, originally from Eugene. Uh, I'm also a commercial drone pilot, both aerial and underwater. And my day job is videographer and photographer for Klamath Community College. So with that, uh, John, why don't uh, we kind of pass mics around and... Well, I've just been a member for a couple of years now, I think, but not really made any films yet, but at least Kurt's got me the idea of making one. Um, you know, I've just been so busy with, you know, home life, taking care of family estate. And uh, right now I'm working at Eagle Ridge teaching digital art class, kind of focusing on some of the um, Adobe products, especially Fresco right now. And then hopefully we'll get into Blender a little bit later. because so I wanted to kind of get a feel for the different things instead of being just like one tool, you know. So, but I'm really impressed with how talented some of the kids are there a lot more than I think they realize themselves. Cause I am like, man, you're really great. Arch. I'm like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, Oh man, don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so hoping that, you know, if I can spin up some more artists, it'll help me maybe later on with my film, which is, I'd like to make a, a cyberpunk film. Thanks. <laughs> so that's my goal is eventually to make that but since that's a pretty ambitious project i'll probably have to do a few things to get ready for that so maybe it'll be a few other projects before that and there's lots of documentaries around here that i keep thinking of that need to be done and so maybe we'll get eventually to that uh that works for the like, stretch which for the low, low yeah i got also don't okay. that mic thank you uh, hi, I'm Logan, uh, and I'm an al alcoholic. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, I just moved here a couple of months ago with my wife. We're uh, we're from Tennessee, and um, I have an associate's degree in video production, and I worked at um, the the studio in Memphis for a while as a product photographer for TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And so I've got, and I do a little bit of writing every now and then, but I've got nothing going on right now. So that's why I'm here and hanging out with you guys. And that's great. My name is Jared. Uh, I was here last year representing Nick Alexander Films. I'm now out on my own after his office shut down here. Um, so I, my career started in broadcast TV. I spent about 10 years in broadcast TV. And then I went in marketing for a beer distributor for about six years after that. So graphic design, and shop, shop, um, you know, all the creative things. So um, now out on my own, I'm different. I will be shooting a documentary probably end of this month, beginning of next month, the oh. short film that I'm going to be working on. This Can you talk about the subject matter of it? or? Um, so the documentary is a local guy that uses psychedelics to try and help people heal from their childhood traumas. Hmm. Cool. Uh, short film, the story is not flushed out. Until right. They're, and sometimes even when you're filming, they're not fully flushed out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's subject to change at, at a given notice. Well, thank you so much for, for coming out. We, we appreciate it. Um, that was a bummer to hear about Nick shutting down the office locally. Though I did see that he's looking to hire a full-time video editor out in Medford Ashland right now. So yeah. Yeah, my position. Uh, um, I'm I'm sorry about that, man. Exactly. Yep. New adventures, right? Exactly. So that reminds me of another case. I think a guy was 
you know, it was back when they're trying to use psychedelics, like maybe it was even like ecstasy or something. And some people, it was just like, they're in a depression or something. Like, if they can use like, you just get out of that, like this, even if they can just experience it once, right? it's enough to get them out. So it's just interesting. You know, of course, they, you know, all the laws in the country, like, oh, no, no. So a lot of these people have to go out of the country to do these tests and stuff. Right. Yeah, it's a big subject. FDA tests have shown a single dose of nothing to remove depression symptoms for six months. So, hmm. you know, interesting. Okay. Kenzie, introduce yourself, please. Hi, Kenzie. Uh, I really good. Where are you from? I'm from the Portland metro area. I'm from a small town. Nobody knows it. It's Malala. Malala? Yeah. Heard heard of it? Can't say I, I've I've been there. But... I know where that's at. I've been yeah. there. <laughs> well, you're from Portland. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm, yeah, I'm a really really small town. Um, and then I went to school in Ashland for a film degree. What kind of films did you do? I mean, they usually got to do projects, right? Um, I didn't end up finishing my degree. I had a family member pass away, and they had autistic children, and so I was sent to travel and taking care of them. Uh, but I was working on a film. Well, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And and Nolan, if you could uh, introduce yourself and give us a little bit of, about you. So my name is Nolan McDaniel. I grew up here in town. Uh, I did some local productions. It was called DreamWorks. A while ago, I don't know if you've heard about like, it. Like DreamWorks SKG? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no. we heard of the people behind that. No, it's like, it was a local production, not like the big guy. But um, yeah, so I've done a few films with them acting, some summer camp type stuff. And mm -hmm. right now I'm just working as a social media marketer for Yesterday's Plaza um, as a volunteer. So that kind of stuff. But I have some friends who are really into film and hopefully wanting to do a short film here in town. Um, she's up in Portland right now getting her degree. But yeah, maybe down the line, that would be great. Wonderful. And I see that our featured guest just joined us. Hi, hi Nisha. We are, uh, we're making the rounds, just kind of doing introductions and talking a little bit about uh, the kinds of things we're working on right now. So just stay with us a minute or two and we'll, we'll get right to you, okay? Um, so social media for yesterday's plaza, I had a film crew come out here last summer, location scouting, and I took them all over town and, and a bunch of different areas. And we took them to yesterday's plaza to look at some of the upper floors. And immediately they said, we have to come back and make a film here somehow. Like we're going to write something to fit around this space because like the, the upstairs ballroom and then you've got the sports ball right next to like a classic 1920s room, like that space yeah and then there's the super creepy like haunted attic on on the, the at the very top like that space is so primed for having a film shot there um the film crew just absolutely loved it and every time that i have a film crew out here i make a point to bring them by yesterday's plaza to take a look at it um hopefully it's someday we can get a crew uh here who who uh, has a script in mind that would work for that space. But we definitely have that on the radar as one of the, the key places for Klamath that we want to have productions happen because it is so unique looking. Right. I, I totally agree. I've only been there since April of last year, and I've been working as catering and bartending. Mm -hmm. But I kind of volunteered myself to help with the social media because there's a kind of black thing there. But yeah, I see the potential there. It's just massive. And there's like the underground basement also around Oh yeah, yeah. I I was down there once, filled with all kinds of like carpets and stuff that also look like it's hella haunted. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely an eclectic building. Yeah, very cool. And then uh, we have a few guests online via Zoom as well. Nina, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Hey everybody, I'm Nina Oberlin. I live outside the Portland area. Um, I am an animator, puppet maker, puppeteer filmmaker um 
only upcoming project I'm working on right now is I have a puppet show that's going to be uh, premiering in Seattle. So I'm kind of getting ready for that. Um, unfortunately, don't have any film projects going on right now because that's kind of taking over everything, but hoping to work on another stop motion here shortly. Wonderful. And <laughs> you did have an animated film in last year's Climate Independent Film Festival. So uh, kind of a, an experimental art project uh, that was part of her degree program that she was working on. Uh, and then uh, Lori, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, I'm Lori. Um, I've been involved with Climate Film since 2017, been a Climate Film member, volunteer, been on the board a couple of years, um, started doing some animated uh, or uh, some stop motion short films uh, <clears throat> and been uh, selected three times in KIF and currently, uh, well, just this past week, and I think I've done the final edits to my next short film. Um, so I'll be submitting that to KIF um, when the deadline opens, but um, it should be fun. I think it's a good one. Do we get to see the continued adventures of, of uh, puzzles and squirrels? <laughs> Yes, it, it is still uh, squirrels, and uh, there there are some puzzle pieces in it, yes. Well, wonderful. And Alice chimed in on the chat and said that she does not have a microphone, but Alice and her husband, John, are going to be extras in the short film that is shooting here in Klamath from that Portland-based film crew uh, next week. So uh, we're excited to have uh, that production team come down here and be actively involved again Sunday, January 28th. We need as many extras as we can get at Night Owl Bar and O'Hare's uh, Funeral Home. So if you can be involved, we'd love to have you there. Um, with that, uh, before we, we get to our guest, does anyone have any sort of projects they've been working on or any sort of announcements or, or things that they want to? Oh, and uh, Anthony's here too. So we'll, we'll give Anthony a chance to introduce himself. Um, Anything that they want to bring up with the group or anything you need help with or curious about? That we want this to be a networking opportunity, so open forum. Just wrapped the project called Chamber of Commons for the Gala Awards. Again, next week before we actually release and highlight everything else. So that's me. Project on the flavor Okay. You know, if you um do you do my, well with Nick Alexander films, you do a lot of commercial work, uh, of course. Um Three Rivers uh Vector and Mosquito Control in town wants to do a commercial about bed bugs from the perspective of the bug. So a lot of like low level shots and uh, you know, ground level cameras that like escape. Um, if you're interested, they're looking to hire uh, someone to create that. And I'm I'm so crazy busy right now, I, I can't work on it. So if that's of interest to you, that that, that would be a paid gig. So, um, Anthony, hello, sir. Thank you for being here. Um, we made the rounds. If you could introduce yourself to everyone as well. So uh, my name's Anthony Lee Thornton. I have a film production company called Hands of Service TV here in uh, Klamath Falls. Uh, recently, I began uh, the process of filming my first feature film. Um, all the elders in the business tell me to take it slow and start off with a five-minute YouTube video, but um, I believe in taking bullets right to the feet, so I'm starting out with a feature. Um, I began the fitting process, uh, began to work with a couple of talents. Um, I've got the suit for the male figures and the cosplay being created for the um, females. So that was an interesting start to the process with the fittings, uh, getting to know everybody, signing the contracts. And I am moving forward from there. Uh, the first filming date is uh, March 19th. So I'm pretty excited. Great. And are you filming that uh, here locally or or uh, elsewhere? Because I know you, you, you're uh, in the process of trying to move, right? So uh, yes, I actually uh, was blessed this week with a uh, extension on the lease. So I will oh. finish everything up here. Oh, fantastic. And so the film will be filmed 100% Klamath Falls. Um, all things in the film are organ based. All the clothing is created right here in Klamath Falls. Um, and as far as like, I got ideas from other people's films. When you see like the refrigerator, they had like Tillamook cheese, mm -hmm. Tillamook milk, ice cream, you know, so uh, just trying to use as much organ product throughout. Um, a lot of companies have been contacting to have their products and businesses within the film so that's been a blessing wonderful well welcome everyone thank you so much for joining us we greatly appreciate it and we have our special guest here with us hello nisha 
Nisha is, is no stranger to our or organization. Uh, she had a film in our 2021 Climate Independent Film Festival, A Hurricane with Fire, documentary about the the aftermath of the horrible fires that happened out in Ashland in the Phoenix area a couple of years ago. And she is a representative of OMPA, which I will give her uh, an opportunity to explain what that is and how that can help all of us. But thank you so much for, for being our guest. We we get just like the cameras and cocktails events that I always see you at out in the Medford Ashland area. Um, these are our meetings that we get together in Klamath County every single month to kind of go over what we're working on and network. And we always try to bring in someone from the industry to talk to us about how they got into the industry, their experiences, any advice you may have, some of the projects you might have worked on, and, and um, we try to vary it every single month. So I wanted you to come on to talk a little bit about OMPA and, of course, your background. So um, let's get a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Sure, yeah. Um, let's see, do you want me to start with the OMPA or my background? Which uh, let, let's get to know you first, and then we'll talk okay. about OMPA. Great, yeah. Um, so I've been a longtime Oregon filmmaker. I grew up in Southern Oregon and Ashland, Oregon, um, went away for college and then was at the University of Oregon for a while. And there I expanded into doing digital arts as well as film, being a film major, um, which expanded my toolkit quite a bit. And I was really grateful for that because then after graduating, I did some freelance work and then my good friend and I started a creative agency together where we specialized in marketing and branding. So we do video projects, we do website design, graphic design, but we also then really focused into virtual and augmented reality and using the emerging technologies to be able to set ourselves apart as well as tell stories in these new mediums. And so that's been a big part. I ran that creative agency for 10 years and we also did a monthly event series up in Portland around emerging technologies. And we did quite a few events actually about how it was going to impact the entertainment industry and trying to help educate filmmakers about how these new technologies are a new medium in which to tell stories and how really not necessarily the future of film, because I think film, traditional film still very much has its place, but there's a whole new playing field and arena for filmmakers if they're interested in getting into virtual reality filmmaking and then augmented reality too, being able to tell stories in our physical reality, but with digital overlays and just really expanding out what can be done. So that's a big part of what I've done for many years. And along with that, I've been a documentary filmmaker, like you all just heard, um, I had a film in the Klamath Film Festival, which was so much fun. And I've done a lot of documentaries about Oregon topics and highlighting um, both Oregon issues as well as Oregon creatives. I'm doing a series right now on artists based in Southern Oregon and then might expand it to further all around Oregon, but looking at their identities and their process and how they express themselves through various mediums, through their various art forms. So we have a spoken word artist, we have musician, we have, um, what's the other one, a really talented African dancer. So looking at that, and that's really what I love doing is bringing through these very like human stories through documentary, which is a great medium. And I also do narrative filmmaking and I'm hopefully getting ready to shoot a short narrative in the spring. Um, so that's a bit about me, uh, the very like quick of it all, but yeah, we, you know, through my career, it's been nice to have an expanded toolkit like you're hearing because then I've been able to really um, both pick and select working on films that I feel really passionate about rather than it having to be this constant hustle of just finding the next job, finding the next job, but really with my filmmaking side of things, being able to work on projects that I really love and I'm really happy to put, as you all know, hundreds of hours into because filmmaking is such a labor of love. Um, and then also with having the other skill sets too, being able to work branding, commercial, you know, all of that um, and the virtual augmented reality side of things. And now with AI emerging too, I do, do a lot of consulting in those realms and talking to brands and businesses about how they can leverage these new technologies to tell their stories and what mediums are best to tell stories in. Because sometimes a traditional commercial or film is the best medium and it's not great to put it into virtual reality. So really knowing where and how to tell a story and then how there are these principles of storytelling. That's why I'm always encouraging filmmakers. I'm like, hey, you guys already have 
uh, head above many because you know how to tell great stories. And so really there's just some differences when it comes to somebody being fully immersed and being able to interact with and engage in any area. You can't guide them as much, but there are ways to subtly guide. And then it opens up so much too about being able to tell more branching narratives or being able to have this level of interactivity. Um, so it's been a really fun career to be able to have my fingers in various areas and just see how storytelling unfolds in multiple mediums. Does anyone else here own uh, virtual virtual reality headsets or have you dabbled with them much? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have an I have an Oculus Quest and I have an HTC Vive, so I'm I'm a pretty active uh, VR user, and uh, it is interesting. Most people buy a headset thinking that it's just for games. Uh, you know, the most popular one is probably Beat Saber. You know, everyone's kind of played that. Um, but there are a lot of films where you're just immersed in the middle of it. And anywhere you can look all around, things are happening all around you. And it's a whole new way to watch and also create films where as it's, uh, you can, because normally we're focused on one area on, on a flat screen, right? But when it's fully immersible, up, down, left, right, all, all around, you can focus on all sorts of different areas and you can rewatch the film multiple times and see something completely different each time, which gives all, all now it, but yeah, you might be looking at a totally different area and as the story pr progresses. So it it makes for a whole new film experience. And and it is still kind of emerging and still very experimental, but I love the fact that Nisha is actively involved in that. So, so it's kind of like that choose your own adventure. In in it's kind kind of, yeah. You you can be fully immersed in all sorts of different things. Like there's one that um that I've shown to to kids that they they really love. That's very popular on, on the Oculus. I think it's called Alouette or something like that. And it's a essentially a cloud city that feels very sort of French or Venetian uh, that follows a little girl all around. But you can be following the main story arc, but you can also be looking at all of the different buildings and all the different families doing all these different things throughout the entire thing. So you can watch that film ten times and get a totally different experience every single time, as opposed to the camera being focused on one specific topic. So it opens up a whole new avenue for filmmaking and storytelling. So uh, Nisha, can you kind of delve into how how you've helped to kind of nurture that a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so as you're hearing, you know, it really does, and there's a few different ways that you can approach virtual reality filmmaking too. There's 360 video, which is similar, you know, you're doing it in physical environments, you're taking the video, and there's considerations there too, whereas with a traditional camera you're just pointing at one direction and you're guiding where the audience is looking with 360 video somebody can look anywhere and so then you get into the nuances of how to guide attention with lighting and with people you know like in, in real life it's a lot like being in physical reality if somebody is to your side and they're like hey look over here you're probably going to do it and so that's the way to be able to help and guide the attention in 360 video. And with that, a lot of times too, it will be, um, yeah, just, you know, more like in an environment, maybe you have, maybe it's a narrative and a scene is playing out, or maybe it's more of a documentary and you're putting somebody in a space that they couldn't normally visit or in an interesting environment or with an interesting person. Um, and the consideration there is that you do want to make it novel enough. Again, this goes back to don't just do it in this medium because it's a new cool thing, right? Because people sitting, like, say you put them by a creek side. Okay, maybe somebody will be interested in that for, like, a minute. But if you set them there for, like, 15 minutes with nothing going on, they're going to want to take the headset off. So that's where the storytelling really comes in, too. Um, and then the other option is to do more of a digital approach to it, meaning that you build out an entire environment um, in Unity or Unreal. Those are different game development platforms that you work with for virtual reality too. And then you're able to create a totally fantastical, you know, animated style or whatever style you're doing, but another world that then you're bringing people into. And with those experiences too, you can build in a lot more interactivity where say somebody is looking a certain direction or walks a certain direction or picks up a certain item. Maybe that unlocks a different part of the story so everybody's having kind of like a game it's a bit like filmmaking and game design coming together right then the story is unfolding in these different ways depending on how the user is engaging with the story um, and I've seen I helped let's see it was 
in 2020 and 2021, the Venice Film Festival, which is the big one there, they've had a VR component for a long time to their film festival. But during COVID, they couldn't do it, obviously, because, you know, we were all in lockdown. But they chose just one place in the United States to do a, a um, what they call an expanded, which was a satellite event with all of their curated films. And my company helped to put on the event at the Portland Art Museum. And it was really cool because we got to see so many of the curated and like top caliber VR experiences that were coming out, VR films that were coming out. And that's something that I always encourage people to do if they are interested in filmmaking in that medium. Like um, Kurt was just saying, you know, get a headset or borrow your friends or try one on and then just try different things and try a lot of experiences and see what you like, see what you don't like see what sparks inspiration for you and the beautiful thing right now where we're at with the technology is it's so much more accessible and it's one it's so much easier and more affordable to get a headset and then also the learning curve of how to create vr experiences is a lot lower especially if you're doing 360 video if you're doing more development it's a little bit steeper but still there's so many resources out there and it really is something that any filmmaker can start to put their fingers into so yeah, just encourage, if you're curious about it, to one, try out a bunch of things and then just start learning a little bit about how you could do it yourself too because it's not as intimidating as it used to be. Well, and uh, uh, to Nisha's point there, it used to be that, that VR headsets were hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, right? Yeah. Now there's um, headsets that will actually work with your phone that are like 10 bucks. Uh, so 10 or 20 bucks on, on Amazon, you can probably find them at Goodwill for you know five. Uh, so if you want an introduction to filmmaking, everyone's already got a phone in your pocket. There's certain apps where you can go in and watch films and it, it's just like a, a cheap little piece of plastic. Your phone slides in right here and it, and it does the 3D effect and suddenly you're swimming with sharks or you're taking a spacewalk on the International Space Station or you're you're able to have all these amazing 3D experiences if you don't want to fully invest in a full-on like Oculus or HTC Vive system. You can get started with something very simple and easy and see if this is a whole new medium that you want to kind of delve into some more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, Nolan. To touch on that, there are some apps on YouTube, or not apps, but mm -hmm. videos, and select the VR section. Right. And then I had a friend, they just made a little shoebox contraption, and they glued their phone to the back of the shoebox and just cut out little eye holes and <laughs> held the little shoebox yeah. if you don't want to go buy the plastic. <laughs> also, if you're a, a Nintendo Switch owner, uh, some of the Labo kits are 3D based where you're pu putting the Switch in front of your face and then have a whole like cardboard thing. And it's just like a little cardboard thing around you, but it's full on 3D uh, immersive uh, virtual re reality. So I do see we had another person join our Zoom call. Aaron, um, I'm not going to try with the last name. What? Wash, wash. I, I I apologize, but uh, uh, we already went through introductions. But if you could uh, unmute and introduce yourself to our uh, our film group, we'd love to get to know you. Or maybe Aaron Sept. Sep oh no, hey, sorry, sorry I'm uh, kind of <laughs> my kids kind of screaming in the background. <laughs> hi, hi, um, Aaron. Uh, welcome to the January Klamath Film Meeting. Uh, hey, thanks. I just wanted right. to check it out kind of see what's going on so uh, uh we're the film organization for klamath county we get together every month and we bring in different featured guests uh, to talk to us and also there's a networking opportunity are you uh, local here in klamath no i'm in uh coos bay actually coos bay okay um because i was going to say we do have a film production upcoming soon and we need extras if if that's uh, uh, ever something of interest to you our, our guest tonight is uh uh, Nisha Burden, who works in virtual reality as well as a filmmaker and OMPA. So we're, we're kind of hearing about her background. But first of all, are you a, uh, a filmmaker or an actor or just have a general interest? I've done some short films and stuff. Uh, that's about it. Okay, well, if you have anything that you've been working on... Um, the Klamath Independent Film Festival happens every September, but our submission window opens February 1st. So February 1st to June 1st, if you are going to be working on any kind of short films, keep us in mind and be sure to submit your film for us. Cool, sounds good. 
Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Um, before we delve into what OMPA is, does anyone have any questions for Nisha in terms of what we've talked about with her either documentary filmmaking or virtual reality? Um, a little bit. Okay. okay, go ahead. So I've had this idea. I don't want to go into it too much because it's just an idea, but I want to create a virtual reality. Um, do you think the best way to do that would be the 360 camera for like live action? I mean, I know you mentioned the AI stuff and all that, but I do want like a physical reality. Um, what kind of equipment should I be looking into for that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say that it does, you know, I know you don't want to go into your idea too much, but it just depends on what type of story you're telling. But it sounds like if you are doing it in physical reality, is it a narrative or more of a documentary style that you have an idea for? Well, it's just kind of a concept, maybe more towards like a game, interactive reality kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I would definitely have to incorporate some sort of storytelling or some sort of mm -hmm. entertainment to keep the viewer there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if it does have levels of interactivity, you might get a need to get a little bit into development. Um, but there are a lot of really great like YouTube videos or Skillshare classes you can learn, uh, Unreal or Unity to learn light development. But if you don't want to do like really heavy learning how to become a VR developer, you could do 360 and then just have light development to be able to like have people be able to select. I'm going to go this way or this way, or I'm going to select this option or this option. Um, and beyond that too, yeah, a 360 camera can be great. There's also the option of doing um, stereoscopic 180, which is just, you know, like two lenses forward facing about where your eyes would be. And then the back, when people look behind them is a bit of a black void. But what's nice is then in front of them, there's a lot more depth and dimension. And so you're getting this true, like immersive, 3D feel to it. So whereas 360 video still can feel a little bit flat, but it gives you the option of somebody being able to look all the way around them and the 360 cameras. There's a lot of really good um, like baseline consumer or prosumer level where you don't have to invest that much and you can just start playing around with it. Like Insta360, that's a company that does a lot of them. And those are really, depending on your price point, they have lots of affordable ones. Um, and there's always new ones coming out. So it's like, I would recommend just kind of starting to look, if you're interested in 360, then starting to look at the best 360 cameras at your price range. Um, and it's it's nice because when you get one, if you don't get like a super high level one, there's still nowadays, the quality is quite good. Even for the base level ones, you can start playing around, see if you like it, see how you like telling storytelling and in that medium. And then if you feel really passionate, then you can like upgrade to a nicer camera, kind of like with filmmaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so then it's just a bit of a decision about, okay, do I want to do 360? Do I want to do 180? And again, if you have a headset or even like a Google Cardboard or just a really simple headset on YouTube, you can find a lot of videos that are the 360 as well as you can find the stereoscopic 180. And when you're in VR, then you'll be able to see what that looks like. Um, if you have a Canon camera too, they released a lens that does stereoscopic 180. I believe it's kind of pricey, but again, it's nice to be able to just use your camera that you have and then pop that lens on, and then you can start playing around with 180 filming. Uh, so that's a good thing to know. And yeah, I, I would just encourage you to start <laughs> start playing with it. And does that answer your question about like some directions to go and some things you can explore? Yeah, definitely. And then I usually use Final Cut Pro. Is mm -hmm. there a way to use it for VR? I yes. I dabbled in it too much. Just very yeah. editing, but... There, there is a VR and 360 option. Uh, so I'll watch a couple of YouTube tutorials, but I've dabbled with that as well in Final Cut. So okay. yes. Yeah, exactly. Final Cut and Premiere too. They both have the 360 options in VR and... Again, if you're just trying to edit a film together, that'll be enough for you. If you do want to have a little bit of interactivity, that's where it gets into a little bit of the development side of things. But don't let it be intimidating because really it's it's not that hard either. They've made like Unreal uh, has made it very accessible for even non-coders to be able to start to learn how to develop in that platform. And they have their own set of tutorials that are totally free for anybody to take 
and they have like learning paths and everything. So it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very accessible these days, which is great. Cause when I first got into it, which was 10 years ago, that was not the case. So now seeing it here and even like with AI and using chat GPT, if you're having an issue, you're like, how do I code this out in unreal engine? And I'm trying to do this. It can help you. <laughs> so there's so many ways to learn nowadays. Um, I should say also, we have a 360 camera in the Klamath Film Equipment Collection. So if you're a Klamath Film member, again, it's only 25 bucks a year, you could check out our 360 camera and dabble all you want with experimenting with this. Um, I've I've done a little bit of 360 camera work, not a ton, but I did create a, uh, you know, as I mentioned uh, at the start, my, my day job is a videographer for Klamath Community College. So I use a 360 camera to create a virtual tour of campus so people can go on the website and explore all of our buildings around campus, you know, from uh, of see, seeing the hallways and classrooms and whatnot, and just kind of click, click through. So that that's an example of the kind of thing you can do with a very basic 360 camera is, uh, um, uh, you think of like Google Maps, yeah. right? You know, you get like the the street view on on Google on Google Maps, or you can kind of click through and advance down. Same sort of vibe, you know. So you can you can do that stuff very easily with a 360 camera. Creating something that's more animated or immersive it, that takes a lot more talent and work and and effort. But you can get started with something very basic. There's there's also different modes in it. Like you can do like uh, one really popular thing is called Little Planets. We're, we're basically think of like a a, a selfie stick, uh, you know. And I, I know people always make fun of of selfie sticks, but if you have a 360 camera on a selfie stick, you can essentially make it look like you're standing on your own, like little Dr. Seussian style planet. Uh, I messed around with it once or twice of like jumping on a trampoline with a selfie stick just to create like the the trampoline is the entire world and here's me jumping on it um so you can do really fun things with 360 cameras as just like experimental little side I, jared have you ever done any, any 360 stuff with nick or no no we, we didn't have any 360 cameras okay he looked at it a couple of times i have seen him just doing some music videos and mm -hmm. so really cool effect where because it's so wide angle, it looks like there's a lot of distance between you and the person that you're really pulled out. Of. Right. You can also wrap back into it and close that distance. So if you're moving the camera and being able to do that in post, excuse me, gets kind of a dolly zoom effect, but it's more fisheye dolly zoom. Right. Yeah. It, it With a lot of the 360 cameras, especially the cheaper ones, it's always going to look a little fisheye vibe. But that's, that, that's, that's not bad. It's nice that you can kind of move. And as, as you mentioned, Nolan, YouTube has full capacity for 360 videos to be posted where they can just, you know, navigate with the mouse on the YouTube window to look all, all around. So it takes a little bit of formatting, but nothing that a YouTube tutorial can't very quickly solve for you. So I do see Lori had a question in the chat. Let me get a little bit closer to the screen to read it. Uh, so Nisha, uh, Lori's interested to know your perspective of what's key to great storytelling. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, as you all hear coming from both the filmmaking side of things, as well as the VR, AR, and then also just branding in general, which is all about storytelling. Um, it's, you know, how do you summarize it all into one thing? But I think really the key is to have a compelling narrative and a compelling character and challenge. And that's something that I actually find is missing in VR experiences that are not great is they miss that like key aspect of what we as filmmakers know, which is having some kind of obstacle, some kind of tension in there is really what drives the story, what makes people interested, what makes people want to watch because then it relates to one's own life, one's own challenges, even if it's in a symbolic way, being able to see the protagonist, the hero face some kind of issue, some kind of challenge, start here and have to make a journey internally and externally to wind up here in a new change place. Is That's the heart of storytelling, right? Um, and so sometimes in VR, like I was saying before, they'll just drop you into a scene of sitting by a creek, which if it's a meditation app and that's like what you're trying to do, that's one thing. But a lot of times they'll do that and be like, this is the story. This is the experience. 
well, there's no tension there. And so really having some kind of element, it can be a character or it can be environmental, or it can be like with games too, being able to have some kind of problem you as the viewer, as the audience are trying to solve if you have more interactivity. Um, if it's a more passive VR, AR experience, then it can be more about like, oh, there's some kind of environmental thing happening, or there is some kind of issue that the character that I'm watching go on this journey and feeling like I'm right there with them because that's it's so immersive that you really do feel like you're right there with the other people or other person that's in the scene what are they trying to overcome so one VR experience that came out quite a while ago but still is stuck with me um, is the they did it alongside the free solo movie which I don't know do you all know about that or have you seen it uh, Alex Arnold, I forget his last name, but he's basically like the most famous free solo rock climber. So he scales these giant mountain sides and giant rocks um, in all over the world. But this one, I believe, was like in Yosemite National Park. And it was the biggest one and nobody had ever free soloed, which means he had no ropes. He had nothing holding him in. And he's on this cliffside that's like thousands of feet and just climbing up, climbing up one wrong move he falls to his death, which is horrible. Um, but they did a VR component to that as well. And it's just 360 video. But what's so interesting about it is one, it's high stakes. Two, it gives you a perspective that you could never have otherwise. Being there right with him and being fully immersed in it is so incredible. And then seeing his process, seeing his journey, and he reflects the experience was a really well-told story too, because in the beginning, you're sitting there with him as he's getting ready to go up and he's talking, uh, not directly to the camera, but he's talking about like his nerves, his anticipation, how he gets in the right mindset, getting ready to do this. Then you're right there with him as he's doing it, as he's facing this insurmountable challenge. And you're right there on the cliffside with him. And in VR, it feels real. So some people even look down and they're like getting a little scared themselves. And then you end it with him having made it triumphantly. He's alive. You're at the top of the mountain with him and you're celebrating and you're feeling that joy as well. And so I say, no matter what medium you're doing it in, no matter how you are telling the story, really those key components of storytelling of that journey is what makes a great story. And it's the same with if you're doing commercial work, branding, all of that. It can be trunkified. It can be aspects of it. There's always something there that's going to grab a viewer, an audience member, a person that is, you know, interacting with the content. Otherwise, it's just going to be flat. So um, Nisha brought up a really interesting point, and uh, I don't want to get into a whole cinema studies history lecture too much here. But um, for those of you who do know your film history... Uh, or if you've ever gone on YouTube and you catch um, like restored footage of scenes from the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, from the really when the technology was first emerging, most of that stuff is just a camera static as people walk by curiously looking at it. Like, here's the streets of New York in 1902. Here's Paris, France in 1896. Or, you know, here's the, the scene of a canal in Venice in 1890. Those videos still exist, but in that early, early era of film, they really didn't think about it in terms of storytelling. There was more so capturing the ambiance and the experience of, of life. And uh, it really took people like Georges Millet, uh, who's really kind of the first filmmaker that decided, let's tell a narrative story with, with filmmaking. Have you ever saw the movie Hugo? It came out probably about a decade ago. It, it's all it's all about uh, Georges Millet and uh, the, his films that, that were made in France. Um, and then, of course, you know, Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton, the, the early silent film era where they finally figured out, we can tell stories with this medium. We don't just have to capture real life. What Nisha was talking about there is largely looking at VR right now is still in that sort of 1890s, 1900s realm of let's just capture reality in a VR realm rather than really having someone like George Millet or Charlie Chaplin come along, excuse me, to come along to realize this is a narrative medium too. It's not just a capture re re reality. So I feel like it's almost history repeating itself. What we're seeing in the VR and AR realm is what was happening in the early days of film in the 1890s, 1900s. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. And it has moved a lot over the, even like last few years, as more and more people are coming into the space, more filmmakers, more storytellers. 
um, and learning how to tell in this particular medium, like you're saying, it started off pretty static uh, by and large. And there were some standouts even in the beginning days. Um, and now it's getting a little bit more engaging and people are figuring out for this particular medium, like I was saying too, how to take it that step further of, it's not a 2D film. It's not just a square like I'm in right now, right? So how do you embed interactivity into it? How do you take it to the next layer? So it's not only just like a really well-told film in a traditional sense, but it pushes the edges of what can be done and it brings together the mediums of filmmaking and game design and all of these other spaces, sound design, to be able to create such a more deeply immersive um, experience. And that's something that our company did too, working with embodiment with VR too. So one example is that we had a client that was a real estate client building out a giant master plan community with hundreds of homes in it. And they wanted a tool to be able to sell these homes before they were built. Um, and so we designed out a virtual reality bike tour through the future of the community with all of the homes to scale, all of the trees exactly where they would be. And we did it where we had people put on a VR headset and had a physically mounted stationary bike. So people actually got onto the bike with the headset on and pedaled through and their pedal movements were being tracked. So it was the exact pacing that they were pedaling. They were moving through the future community and adding that layer of embodiment, which is becoming more and more possible. Um, and like haptic feedback too, just gives this next layer of immersion where film can't even bring that in. So that's kind of just to give a little illustration of how each medium has its next step forward even but the storytelling still is such a key component to that. And for that one, we had a guide, a person that was taking you along on the spike tour and pointing out things and being like, over here is where the playground is. And then you see like kids playing in the playground. So that's just an example of, yeah, like you're saying the evolution of it and how to tell great stories in this new medium. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the documentary side of things too, and the business of that, if that is helpful as well. Sure. And uh, for our folks on Zoom, uh, you can certainly chime in, or if you want to put a question in the chat as well, you're welcome to, to do that. Um, does anyone here have a question for, for Nisha? I just wanted to kind of piggyback on that. You know, I think the challenge that most people don't think of, when you've got a square medium like this, or rectangular, we point the camera, we get to choose what the person's looking at. So when you're in that VR space, it's really hard to keep someone's attention where you want it because if there's too much going on, I've seen that a lot of VR experiences as well. So finding that balance of, you know, pointing them in the right direction without distracting them too much. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's the key it, point, right? To not overwhelm. Anyone else want to chime in? Oh, yeah. Anthony, go ahead. Okay, so I actually uh, bought one of the lower end uh, 360 cameras you were speaking about. I uh, moved to Oregon uh, from Florida. I had never seen a waterfall before, and I had the blessing to stand behind uh, Silver Falls uh, for my first. And uh, my question actually comes from out where Aaron's from. I was on uh, Coos Bay there and uh, recording a waterfall and a landslide occurred which uh, now that waterfall no longer exists. Oh, so therefore a uh, business idea developed in my head. Um, the quote is uh, don't go chasing waterfalls. And I've quickly found out why not all waterfalls are safely accessible and I've about died a couple of times. But um, my question to you, um, I have not actually successfully got the 360 camera on the side of a waterfall per se. I've only recorded with uh, still cameras. Um, how would you feel that it will do with the water movement and things like that from your experience? Mm, yeah, that is a good question. And it kind of depends on the quality of the camera too, right? And how high fidelity the image that you're capturing is because uh, just 360 in general, unless you have a really high end, can get a bit more pixelated looking or just not be as crisp as you might want it, which is where 180 can kind of come into the play if you're interested in that, because um, it will give you a little bit higher of a resolution and you might be able to get that. And especially if you're shooting a waterfall, right? You don't really need what's behind because most likely it's mostly moss or darkness anyways. Um, so then if you wanted to like get behind and just have a really high fidelity image, 
high resolution of the waterfall, that could be a good direction to go. Um, but then also like, I don't, I've never recorded a waterfall in 360 yet, <laughs> but that's a great idea. Um, so I don't know exactly how it handled, but I imagine it could probably do a pretty good job and the water wouldn't throw it off too much. It's just depending on like when somebody's in the headset, um, yeah, if it would be like the most amazing, spectacular thing of like, I'm actually here, or it'd feel a little bit like, okay, this is nice little like slightly low fidelity, but not terrible view of behind a waterfall. But what I will say about it, as far as like the storytelling angle and the doing of the experience of that, that is a great example of a way that you can, as long as you don't force somebody to be in there too long, the way that you can make something that maybe isn't as much of a story, but is an interesting experience still, which is putting people in novel situations. So being behind a waterfall, many people don't have access to that. Many people will not do that in their lifetime. And so being able to have that novel experience and maybe going to several and seeing it and being in that space is a great way to use the technology too. Um, there's other ones where you're like underwater or like the one I gave of you're on a mountainside. Those types of things can work really well as long as you don't stretch it out too long to give people these nice novel experiences. It's a reason, it's the why of why put them in VR to be fully immersed in this novel space that they wouldn't get an opportunity to experience otherwise. So. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking that's where the uh, well, idea would do its best is an app where people can experience it, say like a disabled person or someone who mm -hmm. doesn't have a way out um, exactly. from the area. They could be from a desert and step into the virtual experience. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's been fun for me when I've brought uh, VR headsets out to community like Anthony, you helped with with Comic-Con and all the, the v VR area. The first time people experience VR and they don't realize I can be in Klamath Falls, put on a headset, and suddenly I'm on a gondola in Venice, Italy. And it's like fully like I'm there. And then mm -hmm. suddenly I'm on the International Space Station and I'm there. You know, like you, you don't realize how good the technology has gotten to where you can experience anywhere in the world without leaving your living room at this point, which is, is really remarkable. Um, yeah. For those who haven't had a chance to chime in yet, I, I want to make sure uh, folks get a chance to ask questions. I know, uh, Logan, you haven't had a chance to chime in. Uh, Alice, I know you don't have a microphone, but uh, Nina or Aaron or Logan, do you have a, any questions for, for Nisha? Okay. I'm uh, just enjoying the conversation and listening and learning. <laughs> Okay, uh, Aaron, you're welcome to to chat, to butt in or drop something in the chat or same thing, Alice. You're welcome to drop something in the chat if you like, and and Nisha will happily answer it. If not, then we can go on to talk about OMPA, which you are our representative for uh, the Oregon Media Production Association. So let's let's talk about what OMPA is and how uh, it helps with film productions in the area and what your role is. Absolutely. Yeah. So the OMPA stands for the Oregon Media Production Association. Um, and really, it is both a hub of advocacy for filmmakers and film in general coming to Oregon, helping to, you know, influence different legislation, tax incentives, all of these things. Um, it, it helps to bring film to Oregon, right? And then it's also a way of bridging and bringing together the Oregon film community and really a hub space for Oregon filmmakers. And so there's a directory, which I always tell people about, that is the on the OMPA website that anybody can be listed on. You don't need to be a member to be listed on it. And so I always encourage, especially from non- I mean, of course, Portland people too, but the OMPA is based in Portland. It's, you know, it's there. And that's where a lot of the film is happening. But for us more regional communities, it's great to get on the directory because then it's searched by people that are doing a production here that are, you know, looking to do this, that or the other. And maybe they're bringing productions to Klamath Falls. Maybe they're bringing them to Ashland and they want to know the local talent in the area. Well, they can search this directory that you can get a listing on um, and then they could find you. So that's just like a great first step way to get involved with the OMPA is to get a listing in the directory. Then people will know you're here. They'll be able to find you. 
coming from elsewhere or from Portland Productions or even locally, right? Um, and then beyond that, we also do events. Uh, the There's down in Southern Oregon, like you all, we also have our film Southern Oregon and we have our events there, our monthly events. Um, but then there's a lot of Portland events too. And being on the board of it and being a regional board member too in Southern Oregon, I've really been advocating for having more less Portland centric and more Oregon focused connection and really bridging those um, yeah, those gaps so that we can all feel like we're very much included in the Oregon film industry as a whole. And so we're going to be rolling out COVID times, obviously, all the events went online, which in a way was really great, too, because then people from anywhere could access the events that we were putting on um, as the year as the years go on. And we're able to have in-person events again. I'm the chair of the editorial committee, which is both about getting information out there about what we're doing as an organization, what other productions and what's going on in the film industry in Oregon, be sharing content. That's another thing that we have on the website, as well as you can find it on the Instagram, the form for that. But like, say you have a event that's going on in Klamath Falls, or you have a uh, film that's premiering or this, that, or the other, and you want to broadcast it out to the larger Oregon film community, you can submit a reshare request and then we'll reshare that content and it'll get a much wider audience view, right? Um, and then we're going to be doing more events too, more in-person events. And Klamath Falls, you know, you could drive up to Portland, over to Ashland, Bend, whatever. We can like come together as a community. But if you know about the events that are going on, they're great networking spaces and they're great ways to be able to meet other filmmakers and to make these connections. And what I love about Oregon in general and the filmmaking community here is that it's so collaborative and so supportive. And I think it's special in that way. You don't find that in maybe bigger city communities or more of the hub spaces. And so really being able to take advantage of that by meeting other filmmakers through the MPA is a wonderful thing. And it's a membership. Um, based organizations so you can become a member too and then you get to be able to one get discounts to events but also you get a special newsletter you get more information um, but either way and no matter how deeply in or not you get into the OMPA it's such a great thing to know about um, and then the last thing I would say too is that uh, volunteering with it, if you wanna get involved and really like have a say, you can come to the various um, committee meetings, you can join a committee, you can you know put yourself in the running for being on the board when we have our elections coming up. Um, and so it's just a really great organization to be a part of if you're looking to get deeply involved with the Oregon film community. And I've been, I was, uh, I joined the board going on four years ago now. I was on the executive committee, which is like the one that's overseeing a lot of what's going on for two years. And then I'm now on the editorial committee. And so I've been really involved with it through all the years. And it's been so great and such a great way to really connect in with filmmakers across Oregon and really advocate for, for what we're doing here and for, for networking together. So the the big thing there was that it is free to add yourself to the to the directory. So is anyone here on uh, OMPA? Uh, list yourself. Okay. So it takes five minutes to go to o it's OMPA.org, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So so go to OMPA.org, and you can upload a photo. You can upload, uh, you, and you basically you create a profile. So you can say I'm based in Klamath Falls. I have skills in writing, acting, I can be a PA, I, I can do video editing, I can do this or that, and you're then you're part of the entire Oregon directory. So that if there's a film production that's looking at maybe coming to our area, they'll search on OMPA who is listed, who may be available to be a part of the cast or crew. And mm -hmm. so it's free. It takes five minutes to create a profile. So I would highly, highly recommend that everyone do that. Uh, to uh, to join on board yeah yeah, yeah. And if you if you do become a member with the directory you get the added bonus so you can put more of your reel there you can put more work samples you can build out your listing more so that's the benefit of being a member which there's affordable student membership if any of you are students and the annual membership is not that much either so 
you know, as you check it out, you can consider being a member too. But even if you're not, you can get a basic listing, which still has all of your information and it's easy to fill out. And then you're in there, which is wonderful. So if you're looking to potentially work on projects, if you have your own projects, um, or if you're hoping that maybe someday someone's going to find you and hire you onto something, that that's a good starting point and it's free and it takes five minutes. So OMPA.org, highly, highly recommend you create a listing for yourself. I see we, we lost Aaron. He had to run, but I appreciate him joining. Um, I, I know, uh, uh, Alice, you haven't had a chance to chime in yet with a question. Uh, Kenzie and Logan, you haven't had a chance to chime in. Mean, is there anything that uh, you want to touch base with here or just kind of join the conversation? No? <laughs> Grab the mic. You know, the big thing on the radar right now, of course, is AI. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that impacting, in, I guess, in good ways and bad ways? You know, because I, I hate to see technology completely, you know, dumped on. I, I think it's got its place. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, but I, I know that like anything, anything that has a greater potential for good will have a equal and opposite potential for bad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just looking at what are some of the good ways we can apply this? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually did um, through the OMPA, we did in September a whole event talking about AI and its impact in the creative industries, specifically filmmaking, but in general too. Um, and that's online now as well. So you could check that out for like, a, I moderated a whole panel of experts talking about it. Um, but that is something I talk about a lot. So I'm happy to talk about it here too. And really, yeah, when it comes down to it, like you're saying, and we have saw this a lot with VR too, the apprehensions um, with virtual reality and how real it is, how immersed we are, how we're already so glued to our screens. What's it going to be like when we're in our screens, right? Um, and I always talk about how it's a tool, and that's what I see AI as as well, which can mean that it can either be used to for good or it can be used to harm. And really, that's as we've seen various things come out, different technological advancements, that's always the case. So I think we will see both really amazing use cases as well as some things that we're like, afraid of apprehensions and it's good to have those in the collective conversation because we have these views a lot from film and media right of like worst case scenarios of what can happen with ai with the advancement of technology black mirror style so i appreciate that because i do feel like it's good to be considering these things and having these conversations around ethics having these conversations around what can go wrong ahead of time. I feel like we kind of missed the boat on that with social media. And now we're seeing the repercussions and we're like, oh, I wish we would have been having these conversations about what could go wrong ahead of time and had some foresight. So I'm really thankful that that is in the collective conversation. Um, and at the same time, people can obviously get hyper fixated on the fear things. And that's what is what sells, you know, news as well. So that's what's interesting is what can go wrong. But there's a lot of really great uses for AI, especially for filmmakers right now, where it can be used as a tool to supercharge your productivity, to supercharge your iteration process and your idea generation. Um, so a few examples are, you know, if you're coming up with a script or a story idea and you want to bounce ideas off of something, <laughs> not someone, but of, you know, with AI, you can use chat GPT to be able to start developing out ideas. I'll give an exa example from my specific uses of it, right? So I had this story, the sci-fi uh, feature length narrative that I was working with. And I was really struggling with the end because I didn't know it's about a black hole that opens up in the sky and everybody is kind of trying to like, that doesn't happen until towards the very end. So it's kind of a love story between this couple trying to figure out if they can make their relationship work while the world around them is falling apart slowly. And then very suddenly once the black hole does emerge and appear. And I wasn't sure if I wanted it to be a heroic journey where it had a happy ending or a tragedy where the main character didn't make the right decision and then lost his love and the world was ending, right? And so I went into ChatGPT and I was like, 
this is my story. This is the idea I have. Could you help me think of what two possible endings would be? One that is a heroic journey of that the characters stay together and it's happy and it ends as well as it can, all things considered, and one where it's a tragedy. And then ChatGPT was able to give me ideas about, okay, well, these things could happen or these things could happen. And I was like, I would build upon that. I would say, well, what if this character you know, decided to do this thing. And then it gave me such amazing ideas. And so it's not really a tool of replacement, which I think is what a lot of people are afraid of. And it, granted, it could go that direction where as these language models are learning more and more and becoming more and more advanced, they're able to write whole scripts. But at this stage, it's really not there yet. And it's a perfect moment as filmmakers to be able to take advantage of this tool to be able to help you speed up your process and to give you these fresh ideas and to really work back and forth with the technology. Uh, the same thing can be said for Midjourney, for example, which generates um, images, it's text image, and you can come up with storyboards using Midjourney. So if you're not an artist, but you do want to be able to storyboard out the scene that you're thinking about to be able to share with your DP and the rest of your crew, you can use Midjourney Quite easily, you can learn how to use it, um, writing in these different prompts and then generating images out of that to be able to create these storyboards that then you can share with everybody. Again, it's not going to replace traditional storyboard artists just yet, you know, but if you are a smaller crew, especially if you're more of an independent filmmaker or you're on a budget, it's a great way that you can fill many of those roles that you wouldn't even be able to hire people for otherwise. So it's not taking a job away. And then you can fill it yourself to be able to create your production in the way that you want to and to envision it. Um, now also text to video is getting quite advanced. And so say you want to have some light animation or generated images to be able to put in your film, to be able to put in your documentary. Um, Runway, the Runway app is a great one to be able to play around with. And it's not perfect yet. And it does look AIE, which if you've like seen different um, video ge videos generated by AI, they have a specific look to them. Uh, and yet it's a great way to be able to start to boost up your ability to create on your own and to be able to make these small scenes, to be able to make these little animations. Um, another thing you can do is get an image from Mid Journey and then create a depth map. And so then it's more of just like a moving slightly 3D image. And so you can put a lot of those together as these vignettes of scenes. I've done that both for like proof of concepts of projects that I'm wanting to get more funding for and be able to hire people that are specialized in it. But I have the idea. I want to show what it looks like. I'm able to quickly and very cost effectively spin that up so then I can raise funds for it. Um, and so those are just some examples of how you're able to right now at the point we're at use AI for your benefit and to help you, especially if you're a smaller filmmaker or you just don't have huge budgets to invest in tons of professionals. So has, has anyone here dabbled with Chad GPT or other AI services? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I will say I use it in my job from time to time. I'm public information officer also for KCC. So sometimes when I'm working on press releases, I may punch in just the notes of what I have and a couple of quotes and say, write me a press release based on this, 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 this copy paste. And then I, that's not the final version, but it becomes a template that mm -hmm. I can then go back through and kind of edit and adjust and make it my own thing. But rather than if I'm on a time crunch, rather than doing something from scratch, it becomes a valuable tool to create the initial thing. And then I can kind of, you know, develop it for, from there. So it can be a real great time saver. I'll also mm -hmm. say, um, one of the things that Klamath Film does every summer, we teach a film camp for middle school and high school kids uh, that is totally free, 100% grant funded for, uh, for, or 100% free for the kids. This past summer when we did it, we utilized AI as a teaching tool for both acting and script writing. So we would come up with, you know, a place, uh, uh, a protagonist, antagonist, and, and you know, the, the journey involved and punch that into AI and say, write me a short script and see what weirdness it would, it would spurt out. And then kids from our camp would try to act it out. And in doing so, they would understand here's the structure of how a script is written and, and here's the descriptions and all that and the lines and everything. And they had a blast with that. Now you can get into the ethics of, of, 
of all of that if you want, but as a teaching tool to show how a script is written, how that's different from say creative writing, you know, a book or something. Uh, and then at the same time, also teaching kids acting. It was a wonderful tool to be able to utilize of how weird can we make this this story possible and try to still create it, you know, within where, where we're at at, at KCC and, and act all, all of it out. So in that respect, it's it's a wonderful tool to be able to, to utilize as a teaching tool. Now, it can also take some very weird turns depending on what you punch into it, but uh, uh, it it was a great thing to be able to utilize. And so I would encourage anyone who hasn't to at least try dabbling with that. You know, I, I know you've talked about, about writing. Um, maybe if you have an initial concept of something and just see what it spits out and just be like, hey, you know, what if what if this character is named this and they do this and they have to do this on, on their journey? Write me a short story and just see what it does. I just watched a study of someone from the film industry, excuse me, where we as humans still have the edge right now is AI can't give the intent of emo of drawing emotion out. Lenses we mm -hmm. choose, where we choose to cut, those are human things that computers cannot replicate. And so even for art of any type, I think that's where we're always going to have that edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though uh, um, when the strikes were happening in Hollywood uh, last year for months on end, what you mainly heard in the news coverage of it was they're fighting for better pay because pay pay on, on films in Hollywood is very top heavy. You hear about the stars making millions of dollars, but a lot of the rest of the cast is I know a lot a lot of those folks that are appear in films and they're still like finding a second job on food stamps. So um better equal pay, better, you know, health care and, and those things were the main things they were fighting for, but it was also a fight over the ethics of AI. Because the, the technology is now getting to a point where they can bring in an actor once, they can map their face, record their voice, and that actor may never work again for the rest of their life, and they can just recreate that actor as need be based off of those initial uh, mappings. And so it does become an, an ethical issue as this technology can, continues to, to advance. So um, SAG and, and after they're, they're fighting for to still be able to have the ability to have their profession without that that digital AI essentially becoming them. But you, you bring up but you bring up a point in terms of the human aspect. And this is a question that I asked my uh, my, my film class. Uh, and it's a very simple question, but also a very profound one. And that is, what is art? How, like, how 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 would you define art? And I don't know if there's actually an official answer to that, but for me, the answer is art in any form and the genres that we think of. You know, music and film and photography and uh, dance and sculpture and all, painting and all these different things. It is a reflection of the human experience. It is a human. Um, creating something that is their interpretation of the world around them and what they're experiencing and, and them expressing themselves. So in that respect, even though we now have AI art that you see created all, all of the time, unless it is a human creating it, does it actually qualify as art? Because it is not the human experience reflecting on what that, what that artist is going through. And at what point do, does human created art uh, get a premium because of that? Right. Right. I am, I follow an artist called Grimes, and she's kind of uh -huh. the forefront of the whole AI thing. She has a record deal set up where she recorded her audio. She's a artist in that way. And so anyone can go and tap in and use her likelihood or her likings of her music, and she collects royalties on whatever they make and whatever money they receive. And I mean, I have used chat GPT for like social media marketing. Um, I can't, like I created the content, but I can't really think of a good caption for the photos or and it works really good like that, but definitely it'll be interesting to see how it gets regulated because I think yeah. it is a great tool, but we really don't know how far it could go. Yeah, it's how far it could go. Right now, it's a good supplemental thing to help. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a tool, but at what point does the tool kind of overtake things? You know, it, a couple of, you you mentioned you know music a couple of years ago, um, Capitol Records 
signed the first AI artist. And they they put out a big press release about how they were signing an AI artist to their, their roster of artists. And they got so much pushback and hate for that that they eventually said our bad and kind of move, moved on from that because the idea of all of these uh, bands and artists out there trying to get name recognition and trying to be known and just looking for that record deal and you're going to give a record deal to a computer as as opposed to, to bringing in, in a human and and so it, it's kind of getting back to like that whole animatrix thing if you if you, you think about it in terms of, of human versus ai uh very profound how that came out what like 20, 20 years ago and now we're kind of getting to that point and anthony it seems like you have a question yeah or a statement i was gonna say it was nice to see uh last year biggie smalls come back to life oh yeah <laughs> yeah and <laughs> like that, that that's been some weird things like when there's been like those hologram tools or you know i uh coachella when suddenly tupac is on stage <laughs> alongside snoop dogg and, and you know i i wasn't able to make that coachella but i had some buddies who went and they were like did i take something like yeah, you know, and they announced that it was going to happen, but still, like, it, it, is everyone else seeing what I'm seeing right now? This is this is kind of weird. It's really, really, a lot of effort to make that full up. Right, right, yeah. It really wasn't completely AI. Right. They said it was more like the old, the old, you know, mirror act. Right, yeah, old, old holograms. But they they did that at the at the last Coachella too. They for the gorillas set. They had like the because. You know, gorillas being the animated band, they had like the these giant gorillas band characters, like like hundred feet tall, hanging on just hanging out on the stage. It's it kind of weird. Um, I see we have a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, Nisha uh, really asked, "I'm interested to in know more about your editing process. Any helpful techniques or skills around editing, and how editing may differ between projects such as documentaries, narratives, and commercials?" Yeah, absolutely. Um... Editing for a documentary is really where the story comes together. I mean, obviously you have an initial idea and vision, you conduct the interviews, and then in the edit is really where you're bringing it all together. So it's such an important part of documentary filmmaking. And with narrative, obviously it's important too, but you have a preconceived idea, you have the script, you have the shots. So it's more of like executing on that and seeing what works and what doesn't once you're in the editing process. Um, but back to documentary, really within the edit, and I do a lot of my own editing too, I am, uh, the way that I approach it, which maybe this will be helpful to just hear the behind the scenes, is that I'll get the full interview, and this is kind of a funny thing, that was not on purpose, but I did train myself during COVID, which maybe some of you have too, to be able to watch videos in like 1.75. So now I can also edit at 2x, which makes it so much quicker, but you don't have to be able to do that to be a good editor. That's just like a little um, aside of like expedited editing, but I'll lay down the full interview that I've done and I'll listen through it and I'll watch through it and I'll start cutting moments that I really like and I'll highlight those and I'll just find like, what did they talk about? What was the overall sense once I have conducted the interview and I'm watching it back? And then I'll pull out these moments and then I'll start working with the order of the moments, putting different clips in different orders. I'll create, I do, I do my editing in Final Cut Pro. And so I'll create a project that's just like the full interview and me pulling out the parts of it. And then I'll create another project that's bringing those key moments that I like into that um, and that timeline and then putting those in different orders, playing around with it. And then once I have the general flow and sense of the interview or if it's multi, you know, many people being interviewed, I'll put them all in the timeline in the different orders the way I want it. So I get that as the foundation. And then that's where I start layering on the B-roll, where I start layering on the animations, where I start really refining the story and seeing what needs to stay, what needs to go how I want to construct it. And maybe I'll make a duplicate project too. And I'll play around with a different order because it can be easy to like get stuck in a certain way and be like, this is working. This is great. And then you watch it back and you're like, maybe this isn't working. Let me just try it totally differently, but you don't want to lose the original. Um, so I'll duplicate the project over and I'll play around with different um, yeah, arrangements and seeing what works. And it's this beautiful process of the story unfolding as you're working with it, as you're working with people with what people have said. And if there's these holes too of like, 
well, I was telling the story. I, I I got to the part where it should be the climax moment, but I don't really have that thing that's going to evoke emotion, that thing that is going to really push it over the edge. Then you know that you need to go back and get another interview, or maybe you need to shoot some different B-roll or get some way to create, like we're talking about, this narrative arc, this story where it really is a journey. Because sometimes with documentary, people can be tempted to be like, I'm just going to tell this story because this is a story and it's cool, right? But if there's no tension, if there's no growth, if there's not like an actual journey that the audience is going to be taken on, like we're talking about with any of these mediums, it's going to feel flat. Um, another thing recently, I'll give an example from a project that I just finished up, which was a short about, it was one of the artist features and it was about a friend of mine that's a beautiful dancer as well as visual artist painter. We were doing the interview um, and it got to a moment where she was talking about sharing her dances with her dad and it was a very emotional moment. And so in that moment, as this is where it comes into like interviewing. If, if you are a filmmaker that is both doing the interview as well as doing the edit, you can kind of think with that bigger perspective. And so she started to get emotional and she started to cry a little bit. And rather than saying anything, rather than jumping in, rather than asking another question, I just gave silence and space for that to unfold. And then in the edit, too, when I had that beautiful moment of her being raw, vulnerable, real, I was able to, one, know, okay, this is probably a bit of a climax moment or like a very emotional moment that's going to drive the story. So that's where I'll place it within the overall unfolding, even though it happened in the interview towards the earlier part of the interview, and then also holding on it long enough. And that's something with editing that we can get tempted to like, just always be really quick cuts, always be really, you know, we got to keep attention, da, da, da. but sometimes if you do have a nice flow, if you do have quick cuts, taking those moments of breath, especially if it's an emotional moment and really letting it unfold and holding on it, maybe even a little longer than you would think you should um, can create this really beautiful pause. And when people watch that project and saw that moment, they're like, that was the best moment. I started crying along. Like I really felt it. And so that's just an example of one, like my editing process and my mind working both from the director perspective, as well as the editor perspective. Um, and then also how I approach doing documentary because editing is such a key, key, key part of it. Does that answer that part of the question? No. Um, before we, uh, we usually end these meetings by kind of giving everyone a chance to go around and ask a final question or, or, or chime in. And we are getting down towards the tail end of the evening. But Anthony, since you came in late, you mentioned you're going to be shooting your feature film here in Klamath. Do you need help? Are you looking for actors? Are you looking for crew? Or, or... I'm actually short on uh, lead characters. Okay. Uh, I'm missing my actual lead character. Okay. I have not found that character yet. So still looking for potentially actors on, on a local level, male or female? Uh, this is a female part that gets kicked out of her home for uh, contemporary uh, beliefs and uh, becomes homeless. Okay. Okay. Good Good to know. So, so we can kind of spread the word around uh, amongst our membership and, and see if we, we can find someone uh, to be able to work, work on that project. So again, Nisha, thank you so much for, for joining us. We'd like to end this by kind of giving everyone a final chance to chime in and either have a final question or, or a final comment, but it, thank you so much for all of your insight. And, and again, OMPA.org is the site. Please go open up your own profile on, on there. It can lead to more work for you. And I will also say, I really miss the monthly Zoom calls during the pandemic when OMPA was hold, holding like monthly social hours where we would get to meet filmmakers from all over the state. Please push for bringing that back because I realized that by the end of the pandemic, everyone's kind of Zoomed out for a while, but now we're kind of back to it. Those yeah. were really fun getting to meet filmmakers from all over the state and everyone just kind of chatting about the things that they were working on. I really miss the, those monthly Zoom calls. So if we could, if OMPA could bring that back, that would be wonderful. I love that plug, and I will definitely, in my position of power, <laughs> I will push for that because <laughs> I think it's a great idea too. Yeah. So, uh, Nina, uh, let, let's kind of start with you going around. Do you have a, a question for Nisha or any final comments as we kind of wrap up the evening here? I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say I really appreciate your 
you're talking about the dialogue involved with AI and the ethics involved. Mm -hmm. Because as an artist and, you know, being around so many other artists, that's such a huge issue right now. Um, I do find that there's a place for it. It's just finding the right way to keep it within the right people. And I do find that, like, because the last animation I did, I actually worked with an artist who was a painter for years and became disabled. And he uses AI now mm -hmm. to create his paintings. So that's the only way for him to be able to express himself. So, I mean, there's, it's kind of one of those things that's kind of a double-edged sword for a lot of artists. They want to accept it, but then they don't as well. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate the fact that you talked about the dialogue because that's important. I think with everyone, we need to really talk about it and make sure we don't lose track of the artists themselves with replacing them with a computer. But thank you mm -hmm. for the information. I would appreciate it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I agree that that is a common thread that we've been having in this conversation and such an important piece is keeping the artists, keeping the human element as these technologies evolve. And I think that is what by and large so many people want. And so if we can get these conversations happening in the right legislation in place to try and ensure that for our future, that's going to be really great. And then AI can be assistive. It can be a tool, but not a replacement for right. humans. No. Thank you for joining us tonight. No. And uh, Alice, I know you don't have a mic, but if you wanted to ask a final question or just chime in, feel free to drop it into the chat. Uh, Lori, do you have a, a final question or a comment you want to add? Yeah, I just want to say a really big thank you to Nisha. This has been awesome and inspiring and you have so much passion and it really comes through uh, how you're answering questions and uh, just really appreciate you taking the time. And so because of my experience, I'm curious now, what keeps you passionate? What keeps you motivated around filmmaking? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for the kind words. Um, I think what really, to your question, you know, what really keeps me inspired is the storytelling aspect and the ability that film has to really cross divides and touch hearts. And through the power of storytelling, through the power of being able to have somebody connect with a point of view or a life experience that might not be their own lived life experience, you can really help people to see other perspectives or to open their hearts in different ways. And I love that so much. And that's really a big piece of what keeps me inspired in the various mediums that I tell stories in is being able to give those other perspectives, being able to share the stories of many. And through the collective stories too, we find this common human thread. We find this element that is the shared experience of being a human on planet earth. And so that's a big part of what keeps me so inspired about being able to be a storyteller is really we're the ones that are like crafting these beautiful, potent visions that then get to come out into the world and touch people in deep ways. Right. Anthony, uh, your opportunity for any final thoughts or uh, uh, last question? Uh, first, um, I have to ask, can I have two questions? Go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, Nisha, uh, in the beginning of your speech today, you talked about uh, production companies being um, contacted by writers and things. Uh, this week, I actually had someone contact me, and they had some horror films, and I actually wanted to remain uh, G and PG uh, with my film creations. And I was wondering, how do you... Um, present yourself to uh, let them know that that's not your genre and how do you talk to them to say, hey, um, I appreciate your work, but uh, it's for someone else and I find a way. Yeah, that is such a great question. And, you know, being in the role of a production company or an agency like we were, being able to pick and choose your clients and not just take anything because it's work is so important. And so one, what you're talking about a lot is the branding of your brand, of your production company, and making sure that the branding is in alignment so people just looking will understand what types of projects. And that can go a lot towards the portfolio that you present to you. And then if somebody is taking the time to look at your professional portfolio, they'll see like, oh, this is the style that they're doing. So that's probably what they're interested in. That being said, we would have clients come to us and also me as a filmmaker too. I have people come to me with all types of projects and ideas. And um, I don't 
want to take on everything. Like I said, I, I've been able to cultivate a type of work and lifestyle that I'm able to pick and choose and don't just have to take whatever comes to me. And the best way that I found to turn down projects or to turn down clients in a kind way is to be networked and resourced and understand who else is in the space as filmmakers and always have a recommendation because then people don't feel like you're saying, no, I'm not going to work with you. Sorry, tough luck. If somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, I want this event filmed and I don't do event videography. I can, but I don't really specialize in it and it's not something that I enjoy doing, then I know people in the area that are great event videographers. And I'll be like, you know, that's actually not what I do, but this person over here, let me give you their contact. I'm sure they would love to work on a project like this, or they might have time or space for a project like this. So that is a, the way that I found to leave people feeling really good about their interaction with me because I've helped them, but not have to say yes to anything that comes my way. So again, like with your example, if you knew a few people in the area or the broader area too, I know some people over here in Southern Oregon that really love horror films and really love making that type of content, you're helping both people, which is great because when you bring people together, they remember that and they really like you after that. And so then they'll think of you when they find a project that's perfect for the type of work you do. Awesome. So yeah, I referred him to Klamath Film. Uh, he had three horror scripts ready, so I just wasn't prepared. Sounds like you did the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my second question would be for anybody in the group, um, script writing, uh, is it actually necessary for copywriting? And my second question with that question would be, what if you do use GTP? How does that work out? Does that get copywritten or do they have laws against that? <laughs> With the second part of the question, I can jump on that and just say that um, it's all being figured out right now. And so there is this gray area about copyright. And it is true that if you're trying to get like a copyright for your script and you use generative AI down the road, that might bite you in the butt. <laughs> it's like it's not... Um, yeah, it's not your own source material, so you can't copyright it yourself. Same thing with like if you're designing a logo and you want to trademark it. If you do it with AI or if you do it even like in Canva and you're just pulling an image off of Canva, you can't really trademark it because it's already in the public domain, so to speak. It's already out there as its unique thing that is not able to be trademarked. So that's something to think about. And, and with images generated using like mid journey or different um, text to image sources too. Yeah, it's still, it's still being figured out the legislation around it's being figured out. Um, but it, if you're really like wanting to copyright something, you can, again, get ideas from and edit off of what you've created, but putting enough of your own source material, your own self in there is going to be really important. Thank you. Um, you reminded me of something. And if you want to see uh, AI in action, and it, it's advanced a lot in, in the time since, but about seven, eight years ago, uh, a handful of actors and filmmakers got together to do an experiment. Uh, I know Thomas Middlebitch was part of it and, and a few others, um, where they decided to feed an AI bot every sci-fi script they could think of and then see what it would write based off of that and then create the film that, that it wrote. Uh, and the result is something called Sunspring, which is up on you on YouTube. S U N S P R I N G. It's about 10 minutes long. I highly recommend it because it, it's like it's so ridiculous and weird. But they take it completely seriously. So the, the the dialogue is like seriously broken English, like what you would see, you know, of like poor, poor, yeah, poor, poor Google translations from Chinese to Russian to, you know, Thai back into English. Um, but then they act it out totally seriously. And, and they're like, how can we create this uh, based on every, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey and Independence Day and every single sci-fi movie you can think of. They just fed like thousands of scripts into it and said like, okay, what does it regurgitate? Let's make it. 
it's really funny in that how they take it totally seriously. So if you got 10 minutes to spare, go on YouTube and search Sunspring, knowing that this was an AI film they made based on an AI script, having fed it a bunch of, of sci-fi films. So uh, for a final side project that kind of ties into some of our conversation tonight. So Nolan, do you have a, a final thought or question you want to ask? Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us. I feel like I learned a lot. This was my first meeting, but I am happy that we have the resources here in our little hunker of Oregon. Um, so is the OMPA, does it kind of work like LinkedIn as you can search other people and then contact yeah. them on that? It, it's kind of like a LinkedIn for Oregon filmmakers. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, and if you go to the website and navigate specifically to the directory, that's where you'll find different filmmaker profiles and production companies and all of that. Cool. Jared, do you have anything you want to chime in with? I don't think I have any more questions. Just want to thank you for your time. Logan? No questions from me. I'm just uh, excited to be here, and uh, I'm I'm feeling expired. Expired. <laughs> well, I'm a little tired. You know, uh, I'm feeling inspired, and I'm gonna I'm planning to go home and and uh, write something. So, I'm uh, thank you for that. Great. Yeah, John. Oh, well, you kind of echoed some of the thoughts I had. It's like these things are still tools, used for inspiration, but you know, that's it. It's like even when I'm teaching my class, I tell the kids, you can use these other copyrighted stuff as inspiration, but you can't directly copy it. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a character in, you know, Harry Potter or some, you know, or some anime or something like this, like you would, you could create a new character that doesn't exist there yet that could maybe fit into it. And I think that would be okay. I'm hoping that would be okay. <laughs> but there, mm -hmm. you know, but as long as they haven't created it, I think that should be okay for you to do and and still sell if you wanted to, because it's still your creation. Just because it fits in Star Trek or Star Wars universe, as long as it's not there already, I think it's fair game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can create your own universe, too. <laughs> you don't always have to create it based on other things. And, of course, that's where we have a lot of the other stories. I mean, it's like, why do we have so many different types of manga, anime, animation, sci-fi stories is because, you know, people want to create their own story. And so hopefully, but I think it takes time. Like I can see in kids, sometimes it takes time to make that transition from, you know, I, I see it in music too. It's like, if you learned how to play music and then for years, and then all of a sudden somebody says, well, I want you to compose me something. And they're like, what? <laughs> so, I think it's the same concept. It just it just changes the mind how you know how to be creative instead of just it being blasted into you. You know, watching movies than to create movies, and sometimes it's kind of a bit of a gulf, you know, to cross to get over to that other side. But I'm I'm hoping, you know, that's you know. So I'm glad you said about using it as inspiration it, it does make a lot of sense and i'm and i appreciate everything you share with us today thank you so much oh. so tonight as a recap we've talked about 360 filmmaking and klamath film has a camera available if you want to dabble uh, we've talked about virtual reality and filmmaking within the realm of VR. We've talked about documentary filmmaking. We've talked about OMPA.org. We've talked a little bit about uh, uh, Nisha's experiences in, in the, the industry. And also, as a reminder, we have a short film from a Portland-based crew that's going to be shooting here. And we do need extras to be in that film if anyone wants to be involved in that. Jared, also, I have a, a paid commercial project for you if you're interested as well. Um, and we've talked about a whole lot of other really interesting things, AI and whatnot, but now, now that we've kind of gone around, around the room and everyone's had their final chance, Nisha, the floor is yours. If you have any final advice or final thoughts on our topics tonight or anything else in general that you want to share, this is your opportunity to kind of drop the mic. <laughs> Great. Um, well, first off, it's been such a joy to be here with all of you and to be able to have this conversation. Thank you all for your really great questions. And, you know, it's just brought out such a fun conversation that we've been able to have. 
bridging so many different areas of interest and expertise. And so I'm really happy that I was invited to be a part of this and get to talk to all of you. Um, and I think as far as like some takeaways, really with me and my career, as you can hear, something that has been a beautiful element of it and really allowed me to stay agile and to stay being able to be a creative in Oregon and have a good career and a, su a successful career is having diverse skill set. And I think tying into the AI conversation more and more now, the area of being a specialist, although it's great and important too, to find that thing you're passionate about and really specialize in it, it's great to also understand how to build out skill sets around that so that then if a specific job does down the road become less lucrative because there is automation around it, you're not totally lost, right? You're not totally out of work. Um, and I think that is a trend we're seeing more and more where people both have their specialties, but then understand a bigger picture and have these different areas of expertise and specialty so they can remain agile. And I feel like that's a gift we got you know, this gift, so to speak, out of the COVID times, but seeing everything slow down and having an opportunity to build out other skill sets. And so for me, I was so thankful early on when I was going to college and first I was just a film major and then I switched to digital arts and film and was able to build out my toolkit in a bigger way. So then when I came out from college, I was well equipped to start a creative agency that specialized in all of these different areas. Um, and so I think to summarize it all, as you can hear, I've worn many hats and continue to wear, wear many hats. And I really enjoy that and being able to move in these different worlds and knowing how to upskill, knowing how, okay, well, VR may be one future area of filmmaking. And if that's something I'm interested in, let me try it out. Let me rent the camera from Klamath and go take it out a little bit and play around with that. Or maybe you're a little bit interested in AI, start dabbling in it because really it is also early right now. And the early adopters will be well equipped in the near future to be leaders, to be industry leaders. So I think that's kind of the note that I'll end on is just if you're thinking of expanding your toolkit out a little bit, now is a great time to do it because it's so much more accessible than it has been in any years before. Um, and it's it's really fun too to get to play around with and supercharge your creativity in these different ways and expand your ability to tell stories in various mediums. Wonderful. Nisha, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure I will see you at the next Cameras and Cocktails and, and we can uh, recap this great experience. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As a reminder, we need extras for the film. Also, February 1st is when our window for film submissions opens for the next Climate Independent Film Festival. And we need screeners and, and judges. So we normally get anywhere from about 80 to 120 film submissions, typically. Uh, and they're all, all of our films, our only criteria is that they're made in Oregon or the filmmaker is an Oregon resident. Uh, if you are willing to watch, say, 100 films uh, between February 1st and June 1st, we could absolutely use your help in scoring to determine which films make it into our festival. Uh, now, I know that seems daunting, but if you watch maybe just one or two a day, you can get through it pre pretty pretty easily. It's not too bad. And we need a, a nice variety of people to be screeners. One criteria is if you are thinking about submitting a film for the festival, we've, with a few exceptions, I know Lori's been, been a part of this off and on as a screener, but usually if you're thinking about submitting, we won't have you as a judge for, for conflict of in interest purposes. But if you are interested in being a part of that, we could absolutely use your help. There's a an initial screening group, then there's a selection committee, and then we do have uh, industry reps that are, are our awards judges. So it's a multi-tiered process. It's many months. So if you're interested in that, please talk to me, or you can contact me at exec at climatefilm.org. Cool. Okay, that was my question. I was... Hearing all this great information, but not sure how to contact. Right. Is it linked on the climate film? It, it, it is. So if you just go to climatefilm.org, there's an email address at the bottom there. Either info at climatefilm.org or exec at climatefilm.org will, will both reach me. So if you're interested in being a part of that, 
you know, Nisha knows she finished in third place at our 2021 Film Fest. So I, I had to strongly encourage her to come back for our awards without telling her flat out that she won something. So <laughs> there, there's a little bit of coercion of you really should be there for our, our awards. <laughs> Just saying, you really should should attend. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll get to see a film from you again in the future at some point uh, at, at Film Fest. So definitely, I love the Klamath Film Festival, and I will be submitting for sure when I have one put in. Fantastic! Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Look at this—we're actually finishing on time for once instead of we're running late. Everyone, have a wonderful evening. Safe drive home. We'll be back here again the third Thursday of February. Um, I don't know what what day that is, but from from six to eight here at Growler Guys. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Appreciate it. Much. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Uh,